it's great to have a chance to talk with all of you. Um, as I said at the beginning, I'm happy to take questions throughout if you have questions while I'm talking or we can uh, save them for the end. Um, and I know that there are a wide variety of backgrounds in terms of prior knowledge of patents here. So I'm going to aim to like both explain things so that people who have never looked at a patent or thought about patent disclosure can follow along, but ho hopefully also say some things that are of interest to those who thought uh, very deeply about different aspects of patent law. Um, and I'll also note at the outset, I'm uh, primarily focused on US patent laws. I teach uh, at a US law school and um, that's my main area of focus. So I also teach some on international comparative law issues if you have questions related to that. Okay, so uh, first, just for those who've like never looked at a patent, like what, what kind of information is disclosed in patents? What does the patent even look like? Uh, so if you start with a super uh, high-tech invention, Imagine the, the Swiffer mop. I don't know if some of you have used this before, but um, it acquired a lot of uh, market share by having the mop that you can spray uh, your cleaning solution out the front of the mop and then dispose of the pads. And there was actually quite a lot of uh, research that Procter & Gamble put into this and they acquired numerous patents on this. So here's one of the examples of a patent that they acquired on it where the title page gives you some information about who the inventors are, that this is owned by Procter & Gamble, a title and abstract that gives you some overview of what the invention is about. This is a cleaning composition, pad, wipe, implement, and system and method and use thereof. Um, then within the patent document, there are a lot of figures that show you different aspects of the invention from different angles. Um, and all of the numbers here refer to things that are described in the text of the patent document. Uh, the patent will often start with some background information, giving you a sense of like what is the problem that this is even solving? Why was this invention created? This will often be like the intro section of a scientific paper that's contextualizing the paper in the scientific literature. And then there's a lot of details about how to implement the invention and how to implement different versions of the invention. So in this patent, there were 48 pages of description about the invention, including just four pages on how to make the absorbent layer, how to make these disposable pads um, effectively to uh, sweep up the most material and um, then be able to be disposed of. And then at the very end of the patent are the claims of the patent is what lawyers call them. So this is the part that actually legally matters in terms of what Procter & Gamble can exclude uh, competitors from. And so each of these claims is a separate legal right that gives them a right to um, prevent other people from making, using, selling, et cetera, something that falls within the scope of a claim. Uh, and, and the claims get quite specific. So I think some outsiders of patents will like look at the title and the abstract and say, wow, they're patenting just the general idea of a mop that has a disposable pad. But if you look at the claims, like this first claim has very detailed things about well, the cleaning solution has an average exit velocity of at least this. And the reason they have to have all of these details is actually it turns out there were a number of prior mops that had cleaning solution in them. Um, and so, they couldn't patent it at that high level. They have to patent kind of their much more specific improvement over that. So the claims are, are what are legally relevant that we look at each one and say, is this actually new and non-obvious compared to what happened before? And also have they disclosed information about how to make each of these claims, the full scope of the, uh, of the claims? Um, and those are the, the disclosure requirements of patent law, which is why they have all those um, detailed description of how you would make the absorbent layer, et cetera. Um, and, and patents aren't just on things like this. They're also things that look a lot like a scientific paper. So like my physics PhD work, um, oh, here's the uh, simplified version of the, the claim here, uh, showing the kind of four elements of the claim and the um, how they map onto the, the mop. So um, my, my Physics PhD work involved using carbon nanotubes for biochemical sensing, and there's lots of scientific literature on this, but there's also lots of patent literature on this. So you can do a search in um, specialized patent databases. I think Google Patents is a very user-friendly one for people who um, aren't familiar with patents, but are familiar with Google. So here's an example of a patent from IBM. 
um, which doesn't have a corresponding scientific paper, but uh, this is a, the patent document showing carbon-based biosensors and methods of, of manufacturing them. Uh, at the end, it has their specific claims to sensor devices. And as support for these claims, they have a lot of detail about how you would construct these, including figures that look somewhat similar to figures that I drew in my dissertation, uh, kind of manufacturing steps of how you would make the different pieces of them, and also data that like they actually uh, implemented this and made it work. And here's the scientific data showing that they have implemented this in practice. So why do they give up all this valuable scientific information in the patent document? Uh, well, it's because they have to, to, to uh, comply with the legal requirements of patent disclosure. So in the US, this is in um, section 112 of the Patent Act. It says that you have to have a written description of the invention um, that enables a person skilled in the art to make and use the invention. And so this is saying that um, for the, person of ordinary skill in the arts, this kind of hypothetical ordinary researcher, they need to be able to look at the patent documents and um, make the, the full scope of what you're claiming uh, within each claim, or that claim is invalid, it's not adequately disclosed. And so the, the primary purpose of these, this disclosure requirement is just to make sure that we are granting claims that are proportional in scope to what the inventor has actually contributed. So it's appropriately tailoring the scope of the claim. You can't write a claim that's for uh, all carbon nanotube-based biosensors if you have only implemented a smaller subset of that. So the, it's partly a, a cabining the disclosure. And this is also a way to provide information to people reading patents about, um, about this area of invention that can be used by other scientists to build on, to design around, and after the patent expires, it can be used by anyone and enters the public domain. So um, I, I described the, the doctrine as if it's like relatively simple. There's actually a lot of legal details in how this doctrine is implemented. Uh, so like one of the projects I've been working on right now is this paper with my casebook co-author, Jonathan Mazur at Chicago on a lot of the doctrinal details of how these different disclosure requirements are implemented in US law. Um, it's actually three separate requirements. And there are a lot of things that I think are confusing in the case law. So it's not as simple as uh, you just have to describe information so that someone can make the invention. I'm not going to get into those details now. But I'll note that for people who are looking for a kind of overview of US patent law, our casebook is free and online. So you can go to um, patentcasebook.org to download a, a free PDF copy if you just are looking for a reference on US patent law doctrine at some point. So one, one point of the disclosure in patents is to make sure the claim scope is proportional to what the inventor has actually contributed. Um, and as I said, another point is to help people read and learn from the um, information in patents. This is how the US Supreme Court often describes the function of patents, that this is the, they described as the quid pro quo that like in exchange for granting the exclusive right, we get this valuable scientific information. Um, so do scientists learn anything from patents? The US Supreme Court often says, yes, these patents addition to the general store of knowledge are very important. It's worth the uh, price of exclusive use. They uh, have these disclosures that create um, knowledge that will benefit society. Legal scholars have been more uh, skeptical that this is actually serving any function. So a bunch of law professors um, have said, no, no one actually ever reads patents because uh, they have, they're unreadable, they aren't a useful source of information. So some of my earlier work in this was to show that at least this extreme version is not right, that there are at least some scientists who um, do read the patent literature. I did a 2010 survey um, of researchers in nanotechnology and then a 2016 survey of researchers in a variety of fields and sectors and asking them questions like, have you ever read a patent? Uh, so in my later survey, uh, over three quarters of the academic respondents and over 90% of the industry respondents said that they had um, read a patent 
and I asked them, why did you read a patent? Was it for the scientific reasons or legal reasons? And um, did you find any useful information in it? Uh, I won't go through all of the results, but just as um, one illustration there, the so on the left is the academic uh, respondents and on the right is the industry researchers. And you can see that the degree to which they're saying they found any useful information um, varies somewhat by field and by which sector they're in. So like on average, the industry researchers are finding more use here than the academic researchers who probably are more looking to the scientific literature. Um, and like in general, uh, chemistry researchers are finding more useful information than people in software. I think there's a lot of issues with software patent disclosure as probably the area that's had the most complaints about patents in general. Um, but my main point here is not the specific percentages, but that there are at least uh, some researchers who are turning to the scientific literature to find information like this. Uh, and, and from the qualitative comments in the survey, the reasons that they were doing this is that they said patents provide some information that's not in the scientific literature. Um, that sometimes um, information in uh, journals is deliberately not published, uh, like hidden for keeping it as a secret or not published in a timely manner so that you have to look at the patent literature to get some of this information. Um, some respondents also appreciated that reading patents is free compared with the um, expensive scientific journals, which I think for me as an academic who gets to read them for everything for free, I uh, can sometimes forget that barrier to access for uh, people who don't get free access through their libraries. And, and another benefit of patent disclosure that I don't think has gotten enough attention is that they provide translation of ideas um, into other languages. So if you want to get patent protection in um, Japan as a US company, you have to translate your patent into Japanese. Uh, and that's costly for the applicant for the patent, but that then provides that benefit of um, disclosure in that for someone who doesn't speak English and can't read the, um, if you have an English journal equivalent, um, they could read the, the translated Japanese patent. Um, and I think one other interesting result from this survey, so a lot of um, US academics have said, well, one of the reasons that no one will ever read patents is that their lawyers tell them not to because they'll be liable for heightened damages and willful infringement. And, and it is true that like many lawyers will advise their scientists to um, not read patents, but at least for my survey respondents, when you ask them, has anyone instructed you to not read patents? Many of them say, no, I don't know whether this is because they've actually never been told this or they just ignore everything that their lawyers say. Uh, but um, the kind of largest percent is for the industry researchers in electronics and software. But other than that, um, like most researchers are, are saying they haven't been, um, been told to avoid reading patents for this reason. Okay, so, so these patent disclosures, they have various benefits, including as a source of technical information. I think there's also a lot of problems with them. Um, and one problem is that the, the enablement requirement, the requirement that you enable someone who's in your field to um, make the full scope of the invention, it's not very well enforced either on the front end by the patent examiners who review the patent applications or in litigation. So the way the patent examination process works in the US, the patent application comes into an examiner. Um, they then try to search the prior literature, referred to as the prior art, to find things that this might say the patent is not new or that it's, um, that it's obvious. But they don't have a lot of time to do this. Like on average, they're spending about 20 hours total per patent application to read through it in the first place, to search the prior literature, to write their explanation of, um, of why they're not granting it in the first place, to respond to whatever the applicant says. Like 20 hours is not a ton of time to um, do all of that. And they tend to spend that time looking at the prior art, looking at the earlier patents and thinking about the requirements that the patent has to be new and non-obvious. Uh, 
So if you look at the um, US Patent Office's statistics, only 6% of the rejections that examiners are making are for disclosure at all. And I think that even overstates the extent to which they're thinking about real disclosure problems because many of those are um, kind of a more technical issue with uh, what are called means plus function claims that if you write a claim in a particular format and then don't have the right um, description of that in the patent specification, then it's um, that it's invalid. So it's not, I'm claiming a carbon nanotube biosensor and I haven't actually explained how to make that such that a researcher is able to implement the invention. Um, and, and patent examiners, they don't have a ton of experience of like either education or um, actual experience in order to be able to make these judgments. On average, um, it's fewer than 4% have a PhD. Most have less than four years of experience because there's a lot of turnover at the patent office. Um, if you look at the, uh, yes, I see a question from Albert. Um, hi. Uh, yes, I have a question uh, regarding the, the um... So in order to make the decision, to which extent um, do the U.S. Uh, patent officers um, take into account the EPO decision? And then if the, you know, is the experience of the EPO examiners might be, or the background might be very different from the one of the U.S. examiners? Thanks. Yeah, it's a good question. So I think most observers would say that the EPO does a better job on most aspects of examination than the U.S. PTO. Um, I mean, it, it is costlier uh, the the process um and i think that's because the epo they have more um, collaboration among examiners there's less turnover there's a, like, a number of reasons that um it is generally viewed as a a, a better review mechanism um, better in terms of more work on the front end there's like separate debate about how much effort patent system should even be investing in screening patents on the front end versus um, doing things on the back end. Um, so the, the patent office, um, the, the US patent office, if the EPO has made the decision, they can look at um, that information. And sometimes applicants will think about that strategically and how they're timing the um, where they're getting patents at different times. So there's international processes, as some of you know, for acquiring patents in different countries. And through this uh, PCP patent cooperation treaty process, you can kind of start with one um, office and there's some strategic choice in which office you're, you're choosing for that. Uh, but I think that um, collabor greater collaboration among offices could be one of the solutions for kind of improving the um, current issues with um not screening well for disclosure i don't have a great sense of whether the um, epo actually does a great job of assessing disclosure i think they do a much better job of assessing prior art but i i don't have any measures of um on the disclosure issue um so we i, I think the u.s patent office has trouble enforcing this um, requirement now of course like we, we don't have a uh, ground truth of like what the right percentage of rejections would be. And so it's hard to um, figure out whether how much effort they should be spending on um, disclosure, but I think it's more than they're currently spending. Uh, as other suggested evidence that we should perhaps be spending more time here, if you look at um, like my survey results asking scientists, could you recreate the invention described in the most recent patent you read in your field, which is something like what the legal test is that like a scientist should be able to um, do this if they're a, a researcher of ordinary skill in that field. Um, and some say definitely yes or probably yes, but there's uh, the over 20% are saying definitely not or, or probably not. Um, so there's some concerns that even the patents that they're looking at to, and finding some useful information that they may not be um, implementable in, in practice. Uh, and I think a, a, another related issue here is that under the current legal standards, you don't have to have implemented the invention in practice in order to get the invention. So the legal standard is that you have to disclose enough information that a 
ordinary researcher in the field could implement the full scope of the invention without an unreasonable amount of experimentation or without undue experimentation. But that can require some experimentation. And it can be that the patent describes the plan for how you would implement this, but the person who's getting the patent has never actually implemented it in the real world. Like you don't have to have done any real world, real world work to get a patent. Um, so I think one issue is that examiners have difficulty then policing that legal standard. Um, like when does it take undue experimentation to actually implement something in practice? It, it often, I think, takes an extraordinary amount of skill to recognize when there is a problem with the disclosure in this sense. Um, and I think one um, example that helps illustrate this, uh, so when I was um, first writing about patent disclosure, I went to one of my former lab mates who was the first person in the world to implement something called a carbon nanotube resonator. It's not important what that is, but like she got the nature paper for this and became well known for like, having done this. And it was extraordinarily hard. Like she spent her entire PhD um, five years figuring out all of the technical details and how you would implement this. So later when I'm doing uh, legal scholarship in this area, I start searching the patent literature and I find that there are earlier patents before her nature publication describing the carbon nanotube resonator. Um, and it's clear from those patents that this was not implemented in practice by those, um, by those groups. And I uh, asked my former lab mate to take a look at those patents. And she said, yeah, there's some useful information in them. They look a lot like the grant application that she and my uh, PhD advisor had wrote to um, get the funding to do this research because it kind of described what you might do, but they didn't solve any of the issues that she'd spent the five years of her PhD doing. And she like went through in a technical way to describe this. And it was relatively easy for her to do this because she was a person of extraordinary skill in this area. Like she knew how you would actually implement this and so recognize what the problems were. But even for me, having been in the same lab doing somewhat related research, I couldn't look at the earlier patents and say exactly what was wrong with them and what the technical problems were that um, weren't solved. And I think that helps illustrate that it, it can be very hard for um, a patent examiner who is not a person of extraordinary skill in the, the field, they often aren't even a person of ordinary skill in the field, to spot this kind of, um, of disclosure problem. Um, or, or another kind of hypothetical example I like to give is, uh, so if, if you consider um, I don't know if you've all heard of the cronut, the combined um, croissant donut that became very trendy a decade ago or so ago. Um, is this chef Dominique Ansel who had a bakery in New York who started making them and it, there was a time it was like impossible to get them. There were these long lines, people lining up early to um, get the cronuts. And then he um, published a, a recipe for doing them. Um, and I think, uh, that recipe would enable someone who has uh, ordinary skill in the art of pastry making to produce a cronut, um, provided they have sufficient patience to work through it. But suppose that recipe omitted some step like um, the, the directions to refrigerate the dough before rolling and folding it to create another butter layer. Like if, if you are just a chef of ordinary skill and not uh, uh, someone of extraordinary skill, like a pastry chef, um, then the problem wouldn't be revealed until you try to actually implement it and realize, oh, this didn't work. I didn't end up with a cronut. So in order to simply be able to read through the recipe and spot the things that are missing, I think you need to have often a more than ordinary level of skill in the, in the field, which patent examiners are typically lacking. So one problem here is with patent examiners' ability to um, spot these kinds of problems with the current legal standard. I also have issues with the, the current legal standard itself. I think that currently patents are often awarded too early in the process and giving a patent to someone who has um, not done any uh, real work implementing something in practice that, uh, that can end up disincentivizing um, the later challenging work that's involved in this sense. Um, 
and, and then a, a related problem to these prophetic to um to, to the prophetic examples is that they're often done in a way that is misleading uh so here's a another paper i wrote with janet Freilich, who's a law professor at um, Fordham, who's also done extraordinary work on patent disclosure. You should think about her as a uh, potential keynote speaker in the future version. Um, and so she's done a lot of work uh, documenting the prevalence of purely prophetic examples in patents. Um, and then she and I, for, for this paper, we interviewed a bunch of people who are drafting patents about why they're including them or not in, in their um, patent applications. And over on the right, you can see a couple examples of um, purely prophetic examples that, okay, you have this chemical that's dissolved in a uh, solution and you add some nickel, uh, or in the, the bottom example, this 46 year old woman presents with pain localized in the deltoid region. I think that for many readers of patent documents, you would look at this and think, well, the uh, person who's writing this patent, they must have done that. They must have actually dissolved this chemical in the aqueous solution. And there must have been an actual 46 year old woman who's um, uh, presents with pain. Um, for a expert in US patent law, you look at this and say, well, the verb tense being used here is the present tense rather than the past tense. And that means that this was um, not done in practice. If it were in the past tense, we would know that it's been actually implemented. In fact, it's in the present tense. Uh, it hasn't. So this is just a, a prophetic example. I think that's unnecessarily misleading because like only people who know this verb tense rule are familiar with this. And so that other readers of patent documents, including the scientists who are trying to look to the, the literature and audiences like venture capitalists who are trying to figure out what technology they have or um, kind of other audiences for patents who don't understand this can be misled. Um, or for example, if you look at the patents owned by the um, uh, failed company Theranos, uh, you may have heard lots of stories about Theranos and their plans to have um, testing for diagnostics from a single drop of blood. They had a lot of patents. If you look at their patents, their patents don't actually describe things implemented in practice. They're like written in the present tense. But I think one of the reasons they were able to acquire as much um, venture capital and support as they did is that these patents give some signal to investors and outsiders of, oh, they must have some real technology here. Uh, I don't know whether their patents would be valid or not under the current legal standard, because I don't know whether for some of them you actually could implement it without undue experimentation. Uh, but by allowing patents with these confusing prophetic examples, I think that's just muddying the disclosure value of the patent literature. Okay, so, so far I've, I've not talked about um, AI at all. This is just like normal problems with um, patent disclosure. And I think generative AI is just going to make all of these problems worse. So generative AI, uh, I'm not gonna explain the details because I think you have to have been living under a rock to not realize that like, chat GPT and technologies like that are now around and uh, everyone is talking about how they're affecting every aspect of education, academia, uh, the um, industry. Um, and there are, as in every field now, lots of generative AI tools for patent drafting. Um, some of these you can play with for free even. So the Patent Pal, uh, you can do a free trial where I think it's, you can do three per month for free and pay for more. And so you go in, you drop a uh, document to the browser to input your claims. So for this one, you give them some legal claims and it will write the patent disclosure for you um, and figures uh, describing the patent disclosure. And then you could export that into a, a Word document. Uh, Justvise, there you don't write your claims, you describe the details of your invention. Um, just in normal lay terms, and then it will create a patent document for you. Um, there are also a ton of tools that you have to pay to use that say they will generate detailed technical specifications for you, that they produce excellent disclosures. Um, and all of them are, are similar versions where you're either giving you giving it the claims or you're giving it the disclosure and it writes the claims or you're giving it just a lay description and it'll write the entire patent. Um, 
um, most of these I am not able to play with uh, as an academic because I, um, like some of them you can't even, you, know, you have to uh, give your email address and, and get uh, quotes from them. You can't just sign up to, to pay for it. But there's tons of these and it seems like there's more of them um, every day. For the most part, the output of the things I've been able to play with is not great. Like it's not like the quality is written by a, a top-notch patent attorney. Um, but some of them may be enough to, to get past the patent office uh, or at least create a lot of uh, work for patent examiners to like read through all of this information. Um, and I think this is going to affect patent disclosure in a bunch of ways. I mean, some of these AI drafted prophetic patents, I think may be valid under current doctrine, because as I said, under current doctrine, you don't have to have made anything in practice. So it can be enough to have the, um, to do your kind of armchair inventing where you say, well, here's my rough idea for my invention. And the, here's the AI drafted version of that. And, and then the legal question is like, would it actually take undue experimentation to implement it based on what you've given me? Um, but I think this is gonna amplify all of the problems that we currently have with prophetic patents in that often it does take substantial effort to really implement an invention in practice. And this can be disincentivized by allowing an early stage patent. Um, and it will be difficult, I think, for patent examiners to distinguish between I mean, just as it's difficult for them to now distinguish between for human written patents, the ones where, yes, it's entirely prophetic, but it doesn't take undue experimentation. And so we're going to grant it anyway. Um, and the um, ones where uh, it shouldn't actually be granted because it takes undue experimentation. It's going to be even harder when they get flooded with um, AI drafted patents. And this is going to create errors in both directions that, um, you have the improper grants of these AI generated patents that don't actually satisfy the disclosure requirements. And then you will also have um, improper denials of patents based on AI generated prior art. So I, I haven't talked about this requirement yet, but if you're rejecting a patent as not novel in light of something that happened before, uh, you could only do that if the earlier prior art is actually enabled, if it actually does disclose how to make the invention. So if you go back to the example of my lab mate who made the carbon nanotube resonator, like suppose she had tried to patent this, which she didn't, but you can imagine um, her patent being rejected in light of one of the earlier patents I described that um, had the same thing. But if that earlier patent was not actually enabled, like it didn't actually explain how to make and use the invention without undue experimentation, then rejecting her patent would be improper. You, you can only reject the patent in light of prior art if the prior art explains um, how to implement the invention. And so when you have a ton of AI generated prior art that is not actually enabled, um, that's gonna be a problem, especially because currently the presumption is that uh, it is enabled and then the patent applicant has the burden of saying, okay, well that AI generated thing, it said how you might make this invention, but it didn't actually um, solve any of the problems with implementing that invention in practice. Uh, that's a hard burden for the, the patent applicant to, uh, to face. So, uh, yes, Albert. Hi. Uh, yes, I mean, I think it's super interesting, but uh, I mean, the, the fees for application, shouldn't that just prevent this ton of AI patents, patent applications being, you know, being out there? I mean, I talked uh, some weeks ago with some uh, patent attorneys and they say that AI was definitely a big thing for them for drafting patents, but that it would not eventually replace them like for, for the fine tuning kind of. I mean, that was like the, the, the I mean, from the, the, my main takeaway from, from, from that talk. So I, I guess that, you know, the role of fees might eventually prevent that. I, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, there's kind of two different points you made there. Like one is, is this actually going to replace um, high quality patent attorneys? So like, is a sophisticated applicant like IBM going to start using AI to draft its patents rather than using a human um, attorney? And at least given the 
current state of what I have seen, I think the current state of the art, I don't think that the human and the attorneys will be replaced for the most sophisticated applicants anytime soon. I think it's maybe the human attorneys may use these as tools, but there are lots of issues with um, with the outputs. And I, I'm currently working on this with my IP students at Stanford and helping them learn how to use uh, generative AI tools as a uh, aid to them in the kind of legal work that they might do, but that there are like significant limitations to them um, that I don't think are gonna be replacing human attorneys anytime soon. Um, I suspect that the greater use of like purely AI drafted patents will not be by the IBMs of the world, but by uh, individual inventors and um, smaller entities that currently have much lower fees due to the concern about those fees being a barrier to access to the, the patent system. Um, so will some of those um, inventors who are currently writing patents themselves by hand um, without legal counsel, will they say, oh, now there's a free tool I can use Patent Pal to write my patent application for me? Um, I think that's uh, uh, another potential concern here. Uh, Tim. So going back to this issue of prior art and AI generated prior art, I remember like like, like six or seven years ago, I stumbled over this homepage, which basically generated uh, like quasi inventions all the time, it was like a project by an art student or something. So mm -hmm. I remember that. that so, um, my question would be so is there is there like a, is the only way to address this would be saying okay that our patent is doing more is going going into more detail and could that then end up being you know good for the system in general because it forces people to put more into this disclosure being more precise or what do you think yeah i mean i i remember that um that project and which was entertaining i think because that project was basically like taking existing patent claims and like mashing them together in, in weird ways, uh, most of that, the resulting claims would not be enabled and thus wouldn't be prior art that would properly be relied on to invalidate later patents. Um, but you can imagine a patent examiner finding some of this um, uh, prior art and say, well, here is, um, uh, prior art that describes exactly what you're trying to get in your later real patent that reflects real inventive work. Um, you don't have to, in the new patent, be claiming something beyond what the original one was, uh, You, but you would need to explain why the earlier one is not actually enabled and you would need to have information in the one you're trying to get that's um, actually enabling the invention. Maybe that's a good thing and that um, uh, it's requiring the later inventor to um, demonstrate that they really are adding more to this. But if the earlier AI generated um, piece is granted a patent, like that seems problematic. So I'm concerned about AI generated patents being granted improperly by the patent office and then later being relied on as prior art when they weren't actually enabling anything. Um, so, so my like last, uh, thoughts here is so, like, this is, this is a project I am currently working on, uh, with a, um, talented student of mine, Victoria Fang, who's a former patent examiner and who also knows a lot about generative AI and has been helping me, um, work through these tools and thinking about what can we do in light of these problems. So these are some preliminary thoughts that I have, but I'd also love to hear, uh, thoughts that any of you have about how to improve disclosure in general and in light of the um, growth of generative AI um, patent drafting. So one, as I've already noted, I think the current legal standard of allowing inventions based on nothing that has been implemented in practice, like that's worth uh, re-examining. And like, if you require some actual working examples or like some demonstration that you did something in the real world, like AI can't generate that, it can't generate um, real data that gets described in the past tense properly. Um, so that could help both in general, but also with the um, AI generated patents. I think there's things that the patent office can do in terms of 
training for examiners. Um, as I mentioned, currently these disclosure doctrines don't get a lot of attention in the patent examination process. Uh, the examiners that I have talked to say, yeah, I don't think I ever uh, uh, gave a rejection for a um, disclosure issue. Like that's not something that was emphasized by my supervisor or anything. Um, and getting more guidance on when the patent office would expect these kinds of rejections, including sample rejections. Like the, the patent office has uh, given sample rejections for the patent eligibility, the patent level subject matter requirements, which examiners find useful as just a model of like, what would a proper rejection look like in this context. They don't have anything like that in the disclosure requirements. And I think that's um, something that'd be easy for the patent office to do. It also seems worth experimenting with bringing more scientific expertise into patent examination. And um, so I, I have worked with my colleague, Dan Ho, to do a randomized controlled trial about uh, patent peer review focused on prior art. We recruited a bunch of scientists and got them to uh, indicate whether they were familiar with any relevant prior art to some pending patent applications. And we submitted that to the patent office using a mechanism that allows any third party to submit um, relevant prior art. And we had uh, somewhat positive results, like results in the direction you would expect, although overall it was, uh, I think, illustrated the kind of barriers between science and law and the work required to get scientists to understand what is actually relevant to patent examiners. So it made me think that's probably not the most cost-effective way to improve the patent examination process. Uh, but that's in part because patent examiners are relatively good at identifying prior art. And I think things like giving them some more time to do this is more effective than bringing in a outside expert for something like disclosure that I think patent examiners are not institutionally well situated to do. Perhaps peer review would be more effective. Uh, and this could be external peer review, like you're familiar with for scientific journals. It could also be kind of more specialized experts within the patent office. So if you have some people with greater scientific training who are working in collaboration with the main examiners situated within the patent office, whose role is to look for disclosure problems, like that seems potentially worth um, a pilot program or experimenting with. Um, and it's also worth thinking about, like, are there ways that examiners themselves can use AI to, uh, to evaluate these problems? Um, and I mean, the, the US Patent Office is thinking about all of these things. And they're also thinking about, like, should they require disclosure of AI in the um, patent application process? Like, if a patent applicant has used AI for any aspect of that, ranging from the invention to the drafting of the application themselves, um, should they have to disclose that to the patent office? They're currently uh, requesting comments on that. And um, so that's the kind of problem that we are also thinking about. So I will stop there and I uh, look forward to your questions. Mm -hmm.